This conference will now be recorded. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Cole. For those that don't know me, the president of the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce, and we're here today. Um, have a presentation for marketing healthcare in a COVID environment. And without a further ado, want to do a couple of chamber shameless plugs, but we appreciate everybody here. But I also want to introduce and uh, thank all of our trustees, uh, Fairwinds uh, Credit Union, Avalon Park Group, Greater Florida Insurance, Duke Energy, Orlando Health, Advent Health, the Orlando Law Group, and Avalon Insurance Services. So I want to say thank you to all of them as we give them due recognition for them being a great part of the chamber. And uh, we want to thank everybody that is here on the call today. I hope you get some great information and uh, uh, with what we have here. So I'm going to uh, ask you if you can mute your mics just so we can hear all of our speakers this morning. Uh, and then on that, uh, if you have a question, uh, you can text it into the chat over on, the, on your piece there, and I'll be glad to read it off. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get going with those. If there is something, we can always get that going. But without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists. I'm going to read off their names. I'm going to have each one of them tell them a little bit about themselves, because uh, I hate doing bios, and I think people can kind of tell who they are right off. But I do want to welcome Jennifer Thompson with Insight Marketing, uh, John Kelly with, um, with Orlando Medical News, Quentin Gunn, who is social media for uh, doctors, and uh, I think that's everybody that's on our panel there. So I'm going to start here with Jennifer. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit who you are, what you do, and uh, and we'll go around the quick room once again where I introduced everybody and uh, we'll, we'll get this started. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you for having us all here today. I think it's hilarious that my neighbor, Alonzo, is on the call and that this is probably more than <laughs> each other than even being neighbors. But I am, I have a company, Insight Marketing Group. We've been doing this since about 2006. Um, working directly with independent physicians. I've got between 700 and 800 doctors all over really the Southeast United States that I work with directly. And for the most part, we handle their marketing for them so that they can get back to running their busy practice. Wonderful. And then uh, Quentin, tell us a little bit about you and what you do for your clients. Okay, so I've been probably doing this since 2000. Uh, I worked for a company initially called Locate a Doc. Uh, we started out as a lead generation platform, uh, which led into practice development. Uh, and most of what I do is helping practices to reorganize uh, their practices so that they're not struggling during uh, financial crises, as well as making sure that they get their staff orientation down. Uh, we find so many practices do not have job descriptions, and that often leads to trouble within the practice. Great. And last but not least, Mr. John Kelly uh, with Thank Orlando you. Medical News. Thank you. We're a media company. We were established uh, 15 years ago as a medical um, newspaper. Uh, and as um, we grew and became a regional publication with a subscription of about uh, 14,000, um, we've involved, evolved into a media company. But at, at the end of the day, we, um, we're about telling the story from an editorial perspective. Um, and from a media company perspective, we help position our, uh, our uh, physicians and healthcare organizations um, top of mind. We, we help them. Um, tell their story. Thank you, Andrew. Wonderful. Well, we're going to start out. I've got a plethora of questions, and I'm sure we're going to have questions coming from the uh, uh, gallery here. And uh, I'll start with this one for Jennifer. And, and gentlemen, if you feel like you want to chime in on some of these to add anything to any of the questions, please feel free. We do have a lot of questions and a number of people on the call, so we would love to make sure everybody can get some time in. And uh, so first one, and we're right here talking about for a medical practice looking to market their business, especially right now, what is one thing you would suggest for them to do? So Jennifer. So Andrew, this comes up a lot because there's 
there's so many practices right now that just turned their marketing completely off in the short term. And now they're slowly starting to kind of readjust to whatever this new normal is going to be in the short term. So what we're telling everybody to do is let's focus on putting messages out there that are messages that your audience wants to hear. And if you could only do one thing, I'm going to say to lean into trust and authenticity. We need to be putting things together from a marketing standpoint specifically that are um, really kind of embracing your patient base and making sure that your employees know that everybody's in it for, um, we're all in it together. So really kind of leaning into that authenticity and that and that trust element. So we have a, a lot of practices that are using email communication that are still turning maybe some ads back on um, but really kind of leaning into social media right now just to keep their fan bases up. And um, they're doing that by telling kind of that story related to telemedicine and kind of humanizing it. And a lot of independent practices are just having fun with it and being transparent, being authentic, and then you know starting to see what that's going to look like in the coming weeks ahead as they're kind of embracing those people that are stuck at home and being in the situation with them. So we're seeing a lot of that. So I would say, if there's one thing at all that you wanna do is you wanna evaluate what it is that you're putting out there and see if you can really up that level of authenticity and transparency to those individuals that are receiving your message. Because at the end of the day, I'm not talking about hospitals, I'm not talking about physicians that, are, that you have to go into an office for. I'm talking about, about elective type procedures. I'm talking about ENTs, um, ophthalmology, orthopedics, those types of specialties, and how can they keep their fan base and, and kind of their patients engaged and their employees engaged while we're kind of all at the stay at home stage. And so trust and authenticity is what I would suggest. I think on my side, I think transparency. Um, your patients need to know what's going on with the practice. You've been closed. They need to know where their appointments are, if they're if they're ever going to have them, if they are. What does that look like? How soon do they think that's going to occur? Um, the other thing is you need to the staff that you may have furloughed or uh, that may not be uh, working full time. They need to know what what it's going to look like for them coming back. Uh, are they going to be able to come back? So transparency, um, keeping them up to date. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, social media is a great way to uh, do that. Um, we often, you know, most of my clients never stop advertising. They just change the focus. Um, but I think being honest with your consumer base letting them know you're just as concerned about this situation as they are. If you're still in the office um, and you're still seeing patients, uh, we've had our doctors show that they're using their N95 masks, that the staff is completely prepared to continue to see them in the, uh, in the office, but that they're taking every precaution that they can take. But as long as you keep patients current, you can use MailChimp, doing a newsletter on a consistent basis. Maybe, um, whereas you did newsletters once a quarter or once a month, it may be just weekly. Drop in a quick note to them and say, hey, we're still looking at this day to go live again. We haven't forgot about you. Uh, our employees and our team can't wait to see you. Give them some encouraging news. Uh, and keep them abreast. Let them know. I mean, you're struggling as well. Um, and and being, as uh, Jennifer said, just being honest, uh, mm -hmm. it dears patients. They get closer to you. It it builds trust with your staff. So when they come back, they know that they can count on you to do the right thing by them. Are, are you seeing... Um, and, and John, not to cut you off, I just was going to say, are you seeing a increase in, and John, you can answer this too, in readership and or in 
people's likes or following because people are now at home might have some of that time to do a little bit more of that social distancing or social media piece? Absolutely. And the other thing is, I tell my doctors, right now is a good time to evaluate your practice, to go through your numbers, to go through your staff configuration, to go through your marketing program, what it looks like, what it has looked like, because it's not going to be the same when we go back live. I can tell you that. Um, I am actually, I've been in communication regularly with a group. Um, there are doctors. Uh, I mainly focus on orthopedic, regenerative, and areas like that. So I'm working with companies like Chimera, who is being um, used by the FDA to develop some vaccines and treatment protocols. And what they're telling us is that this is a very unusual uh, virus. And so when you come back to your practice, you really need to make sure you, you put in protocols that make patients feel safe. Because that's the key. They want to feel safe. Andrew, John, go ahead. <clears throat> you know, I can't agree with my uh, with with Jennifer and Quentin enough. But to your question about the uptick in traffic, um, and this is not a plug, but uh, in February we had about uh, 5,800 new visitors to our website. In the month of March, 35,000 plus, uh, not quadrupled, but six times. And April, I pulled the stats this morning, month to date, uh, 22,000 plus. And these are just new visitors to our website. Um, we had an article about uh, hydrochloroquine um, and z -packs, um, that Parish Medical out in Brevard County ran. Um, we posted it yesterday at five o'clock. And before six o'clock, I got a call from our um, our web provide, I should say, our, our the company that supports our servers and our web, and he says, "Hey, we got to pull this story down. We got coming from all over the world. I got customers complaining. You know, uh, no one else can get on the site." And I said, "Well, you better rebalance your servers. Uh, you can't pull the story down." But uh, just to give you an idea about pent up demand, um, that sto that story that was published at. Um, 5.05 p.m. yesterday had 20,515 views. So there is a demand to your question for content. And we've got a little bit of an advantage because as our tagline says, we're your primary source for professional healthcare news. Um, to my peers, other points, um, I had a meeting with our team about three weeks ago. You know, during good times, we're always in front of our advertising partners. I told them, <clears throat> from my perspective, during bad times, we need to be there if it's just even to listen. Uh, and we supported them by encouraging them to uh, contribute editorial, to forward press releases, um, story ideas. Um, and we've enjoyed an uptick, believe it or not, in podcasts and videos during this time. So um, I can't say enough. It's about being top of mind, being there mm -hmm. for your patients. So I know we did this, uh, Jennifer, uh, I've kind of, this is a twofold piece. I was kind of moving into it. We worked on uh, how to get your uh, uh, practice set up on telehealth about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And um, so, you know, to get the word out that they're doing that, that's one. And then I also had a question come in. So I want to read off the question uh, since it was kind of a neat segue that we're going towards it. But um Ken had asked, uh, I'm learning from you that there's some great marketing communication approaches, but with the COVID advancing te uh, telehealth and mobile uh, care rapidly, um, and mobile care rapidly growing, I guess, how will you prepare clients for the COVID when it's possible that patients will continue to demand mobile and electronic care versus the traditional office visit? So is there anything that, that you guys are working on to do to help these uh, the patients and your clients to get the message out that they are doing telehealth, that this is another way 
to do medicine and uh, going from there. So Jennifer, you want to take the lead on that? Yeah, absolutely. So we did that um, that webinar. I feel like it's been months, but it was probably just a couple <laughs> weeks ago, um, talking about how to get your practice set up on telemedicine. So at least from my standpoint, from my company, we the minute we saw that that the the president was relaxing regulations we identified an opportunity to pivot and we pivoted to our existing client base and we said look anybody that wants to get set up on telehealth we'll do this free of charge we just want you guys to be up and running to add some value from a business perspective and that got us immediately kind of in these trenches and we've now set up probably over a dozen practices on telemedicine. We haven't picked one provider of the service over another. We've we've done, I've probably run the gamut of practices, but one thing I really have noticed is that some practices were so quick to get on board with telemedicine that they decided as soon as the, the, the regulations were relaxed, they were literally seeing patients on FaceTime or WhatsApp or, like let's go ahead and do this on Skype or you know let's just have a video call on my phone and it was it's interesting because it's led to a lot of conversations that if you because patients are going to demand this moving forward so if you if you start off using WhatsApp that's what you're training your patients to expect in that experience and if you're starting if you're starting because you know you can't get dinged for a HIPAA violation right now um what, how are you gonna, what are you telling to your employees? What are you telling to your potential patients? What are you training them you know, to expect at your practice? And so we kind of saw that in the first couple of days, it was like the wild, wild west. And now I'm seeing um, probably in the last 10 days where practices have really stepped back and said, okay, we know that this is something that we now need to do. We know that we need to get it up and going fast. Thank goodness there are so many services out there that are inexpensive, if not free, that'll get them up and going fast that they can integrate with their EHR or get it into their protocols and workflows. Um, so now we're seeing the practices are stepping back and saying, all right, let, we need to be quick, but let's find a long-term solution. And then through that, we've seen a bunch of kind of missteps or kind of learning along the way. One of them being, you know, separating telehealth as an option and not just including it um, really like so for example saying we have telemedicine appointments click here if you want to schedule one versus saying we have telemedicine walk-in clinics and regular appointments it's all about access and what works for you and so at first practices were separating telemedicine out from the regular service offering now what we're seeing is more of a long-term strategy and just making telemedicine a potential option for practices or for patients when they're making when they're scheduling their appointments and so now we're, we're starting to see and feel practices that are saying this is going to be a long-term option let's make sure we have the best technology in place and let's take a step back and remember that this is all about the patient experience and delivering care and it's not so much you know putting out an immediate fire but it's looking at it from a long-term strategy and so that's what we're seeing now and it's it's providing a bunch more work, um, at least from my team. It's been a real opportunity that Pivot has allowed us to to start growing again during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And so that's a positive plus plus, I think. So I really think that telemedicine is here to stay. Patients are going to demand it, and the practices that are going to do well are the ones that are looking at it as part of their long-term strategy and not as a quick fix. And Andrew, to Jennifer's point, yeah. um, telemedicine billing codes are now available from all payers, um, carriers for the people that aren't involved in the in the business. Um, that's a huge point. And mm -hmm. you know, historically, there's been a move. If you've been reading any healthcare, towards incorporating a component of telemedicine in all practices. But I think um, the COVID-19 has been the big push that's been needed. I think just just from the telemedicine side, um, you know, these are now opportunities if you didn't make it available within your website. Um, we've modified more, more than a few websites to give the patient the option on that contact form 
to decide do I want a, uh, a video conference consultation or do I want a in-office consultation? And in most cases, we're seeing those numbers go to a, a video conference. But what's the what's the other way you notify patients that's available? We're having them posted on social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, Snapchat. We're letting we're requesting that the doctors we're working with that they let this be known that this is available to them, um, but also make sure that you're HIPAA compliant um, because that is a big concern. Um, and the other side is this is a consult, not necessarily an appointment because you, you can't give medical advice unless you have a HIPAA compliant telemedicine portal. Otherwise, you run the risk of giving advice online, which can put you in some kind of jeopardy. So until you can actually see the patient, you can get a general overview of what's going on with them. Uh, if you have them as a patient, look at their file, and then you can reference back to the things you discussed. But I would I advise that they really be mindful of the kind of information that they're sharing within those portals unless they can validate that there is HIPAA compliance. Are, are you seeing parts where uh, now more than before, are there like, are there advertising or are your clients advertising more about that they're offering these services? And John, are you seeing advertising from providers that do telemedicine uh, advertising through you to the doctors and things like that. Absolutely. On our side, absolutely. Okay, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's no, no. a great question, Andrew. And, um, you know, there is a place and we're moving back towards it, but right now it's been about being top of mind being there for your patients, letting them know that you're still open for business, just in a different way, um, and position yourselves with not only content, but with philanthropic type of commitments. Um, we are doing panels just like this uh, for our physician audience. Um, we've gotten some mixed reviews. We did something on um, investment during the uh, Wall Street roller coaster for docs. Um, didn't have the greatest attendance. We've got something with uh, cybersecurity scheduled for this Friday, and uh, the enrollment is off the charts. But I mean, right now, to Jennifer's initial point, it's more about being there for your patients. Andrew, I've got. Go ahead, yeah. Jennifer. To that, I've got. Um, so. As soon as you get your telemedicine up and going, and I think there is an opportunity to market that because now it's providing you something that you can actually share with your patients and with your referral partners. So to Clinton's point, you know, social media is great for getting that information out there. And there's a way to be fun and transparent and authentic in doing it. We had a doctor this past week, you know, that, that had his big setup at home. He's he's tied in, um, fully operating on telemedicine. You know, and using kind of fun pictures and, and videos of them in their lab coats with their cargo shorts, you know, things like that. So you can use social for that. Clinton hit the nail on the head. You have to update your website. I think right now during a pandemic, your website is like your first line of communication. So you need to be updating it every opportunity that you have so that you can get that information out there. I think that sometimes practices forget that their EHR will often allow them to communicate with their patients. And you know that's a very inexpensive way to communicate. Sometimes it's only text-based communication, but to let your patients know that you're offering telemedicine services because those patients will be your fans out there and they're gonna let other people know as well. And then people are forgetting, but an, an easy update is update your, your um, on-hold messaging. And I will tell you, a lot of success getting press for clients because the media is looking for positive stories around COVID 
So if you have a practice that is stepping it up, there is an opportunity, especially if you're um, get, if you're implementing telemedicine to kind of tell that story of how you're able to provide care. And so we've been working with our press folks all over the state, trying to get some good PR and some, some feel good stuff. But I'll tell you one area that, a um, couple things there. Take your Google My Business listings and update your Google My Business listings with your new service offering. It's free, you've got time, go in there and get everything cleaned up and update your listings. And then there's only one industry out there that still uses fax machines and that's medical. So we are constantly sending giant fax blasts to referring partners, um, to physician groups, to attorney groups, to work comp adjusters, to businesses, and saying these practices are offering telemedicine if you have somebody that needs it and continuing those referral relationships. And so there's just all kinds of different things like completely out of the box things that I think are really old school that we're being forced to look at. But if you're offering telemedicine as a new service, I think that you have a story to tell. So start digging deep into kind of those tactics that you've got from a marketing standpoint. Now, the, the other angle of, of the telemedicine piece is the doctor won't be the only one who will be making himself available. So for those other than the, the doctor at large, you need to make sure that if you're if you still have a patient care coordinator that you're using, you need to set up guidelines for them so that they know what is acceptable and what is not to speak about during the teleconference. Um, if you have PAs that are normally engaged with patients, um, anyone who is going to be utilizing that telemedicine portal, you need to make sure that they have a, a complete protocol as to what is permissible and not permissible, because otherwise it'll dip off into uh, too personal a dialogue when it's a medical consult. And so we wanna be mindful while we're getting closer to the consumer, we also wanna maintain professionalism to ensure that things don't, things aren't said that would be inappropriate or that would be off base. So setting up proper protocols within your telemedicine platform would be a great way to keep control over the process, but it'll also give confidence to that other provider so that they know their parameters. So, so we've gotten a lot here on, on the telemedicine part, but I know a lot of folks are looking on the marketing side of things. So um, a question had come in, is there any advice for workers comp pharmacy trying to market themselves during this time? What are, what are some best practices and uh, some tips that you can provide uh, getting back into the, the marketing for businesses in the healthcare industry in this, especially some of these specialized and, and what is some of those messaging we need to get out? I think newsletters, um, again, constant contact, MailChimp. If you've got a database of followers or database of professional contacts and you wanna stay engaged, um, that newsletter platform is a great way to do that. You can set up invitations to connect. Um, you can direct them to a web page. You can direct them to a landing page. Um, the, the other area is if you've not connected with them via Instagram, and most companies do have an Instagram page, uh, you can message them through that. Um, very likely it may be a marketing company responding, but we always encourage our doctors to stay. Uh, you should have possession of your own Instagram page so you can see what we're saying and doing in your behalf and if you want to make some adjustments. So as messages, Facebook and Instagram pretty much allow you to see as people are communicating. But I would say if you've got an email database that's going to be your goal right now for communication. Um, I've got a database of probably 15,000, and my open rate on my newsletters is through the roof. I did a, um, I wrote a recent article on 
um, how to sustain your practice during a time of crisis. And that particular uh, newsletter had like a 20 plus percent open rate, which was way beyond what I had anticipated. I probably, out of the 15,000, it looked to me that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of eight, seven to 8,000 people that read that. And I was very pleased by that because not only were my doctors reading it, but the vendors I'm working with, they're reading it. So using that as a common re, you know, way to connect, once a week is fine. And you don't have to say a whole hell of a lot, excuse my French, just be, just be specific, go to the point, let them know you're here to help and ask them what they might need. And here's a link to click on to send your inquiry. Hey, two Quentin's points, uh, Andrew. One of our uh, advertising partners, the Integrated Independent Physicians Network, which is about 1,500 um, independent physicians that, that we represent or work with, um, they published two weeks ago uh, 10 things to remember that every independent physician practice should remember. And not a plug here, but uh, that podcast can be found on our website under under videos and uh, podcast, and also in the um, March edition of our publication, the uh, the IPN Network, their ad, their half page ad. If you click on it, it goes to the ten things to remember. But it's powerful stuff uh, from one of the industry leaders, Larry Jones. Yeah, and Andrew, I would back to Jess's question. I think that these are great pieces of advice, but. I would say, Jess, if, you're, if your business is a work comp pharmacy, look at who your true target audience is and then identify ways that maybe you could reach out to that target audience in the current situation. And so I'm a big believer, Quentin, in newsletters too. And especially like the last couple of years, we've really seen a resurgence. And um, especially right now because some of the, the some of the challenges related to communication um, with patients we're able to overcome some of those challenges now in permissions so I would encourage any practice out there to download the full list maybe not your marketing list but your full patient list and put together some very specific communications to explain to them your protocols explain to them that you're still open um, let them know if you're offering telemedicine, things like that, be a resource to them. But Jess, I would look at where your potential targets are and how you might reach them. One thing that we're running into is, at least with my list, because my, my target audience is doctors and practice administrators. And we're finding that so many practice administrators are home right now, and they don't have the same level of access to their practice email. And so when we're emailing them, they're not always receiving that message. And so now we're having to, that's why we've been with a lot of them, we went to sending faxes for referring physician partners because we knew they would at least receive it if they were in the office and accepting. And then um, we're using EHR and we have some practices using scheduling software that is text-based. And so they're using the text-based software to communicate with those patients that they're allowing those types of things. So we're having to like really look outside the box of what we would traditionally do. And I would say that um, at first, most of our practices turned off all of their AdWord campaigns, but within a week or so, they started turning them back on once they had a plan yes, for delivery year. And um, we're seeing ad campaigns that are 10 percent click-through rates and conversions, which is unheard of when you consider that ad campaigns, you know, typically with Google, we're looking at about two to three percent. So when you've got you know double digit conversion rates, there's there's sure are a lot less people searching for providers, but when they find what they're looking for, they're going ahead and scheduling those appointments. And so I think, you know, just like to your point, figure out who your audience is, and then really look for those out of the box opportunities to micro target that audience, because you really may have an opportunity here to build relationships 
and not just um, to, to really like lean into those deep in those relationships and build them more than you ever have in the past. And should also be, they should also be taking advantage of uh, some of the social groups that are available. So you yeah. can find within the industry, uh, if you've got a target you want to go after, look for social groups, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's on Facebook, you know what your niche is. So go to those. Uh, Facebook makes it easy for you to find social groups. You just click on the groups uh, link, type in topic or specialty, and then look for those groups. And you want to look for groups that have a high number of, um, of followers. That way you're reaching that perspective audience in the place where they go. Um, and once you join, they may have some requirement, but as long as you meet the requirement, they'll open up the door for you to be able to communicate with either vendors or uh, business owners or whatever. But we've got all these tools that are available to us now more than ever. Um, and getting in those social groups will be critical, especially if you've got a product or service you're trying to sell to a audience. Um, those would be uh, my advice to you to start developing the habit of mechanizing those social groups so that you can start targeting because there are low hanging fruit there mm -hmm. for sure. So I want to chime in on that on two things here. Uh, for those that are not familiar, we have done a couple webinars and they're on our website. I'm not trying to do a shameless plug, but what I'm uh, with tricks on exactly how to connect with people on the LinkedIn site to get them to start communicating with you that you can send your messaging. And we have actually 2.0 and 3.0 coming up, which is some great tips, especially on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn has a special piece where when somebody looks at your profile, you know who looked at you, and then you can send back and connect with those people that has an interest in what your messaging is. And going into messaging, what are some of the messaging that, that, that people should have? So some of these folks, like you said, Jen, you know, you've got practice administrators, you've got docs. Um, what should they be posting? And, and, and even to you, John, like the content, you know, what, what should they be writing about in these newsletters? Should they be talking about themselves? Should they be putting information about COVID-19? Should it be just, hey, we're here for your service? What, what, what do you recommend for people in content for these newsletters or little blurps or pieces that they put on their social media pieces? Uh, anybody can chime in on that. Education, blogs, the doctor's got time on his hands. What are, what are your top five, top 10 procedures that most patients want to know about? Start writing a blog, start preparing to do videos. Um, today, a doctor can sit in his office just like we are and have a instructional conversation about any particular specialty, service treatment protocol and and really do a nice job within five to ten minutes um or three to five minutes but that that should be now is a great time to build your catalog of information and you're not only building it to educate patients but you're building it to to make your website a resource uh i've got all my doctors writing right now um we once they send it to us, we actually look it over, modify it, change grammar, whatever. But we're telling them, if you want your name to be up there, you've got to give information and we can write it, but we want it from your perspective. Why do you love doing this? How long have you been doing it? What prompted you to go this way? Um, writing and, and doing video, right now you've got the time take advantage and to quentin's point um this great nation needs good stories now so um, i'm interested in good COVID 19 stories um also positioning yourself as an expert if you're a physician um is really important how do we do that um basically being published 
and it used to be word published in print. Um, it's evolved to digital, but uh, I'm a big fan of podcasts and videos. We're, we're seeing a lot of that. Getting your MD, DO, even your PA or ARNP out there talking about something that they're passionate about. You know, it's if you're in print or if you're in medical digital media, it positions you as an expert. You just you can't get anything better than that in this point in time. And it'll and it'll be able to be reused in the future. We're going to come out of this. Yeah, and I'll echo a lot of what's been said. I think um, FAQs are really easy content to create. You got a physician that, you know, these are the common questions that he or she gets asked. Have them go on a quick video, put your phone right there and, you know, put it in a landscape mode and tell them how to be successful. And docs will sit there and bust out videos if you tell them what it is that you need. We have... Um, Quite a few doctors doing webinars right now, taking presentations that they've given, cleaning up those presentations and doing voiceover because those webinars usually are great downloadable assets. And then something that um, I'm seeing more and more of kind of two things, Andrew. One is we've got several physicians that are starting to do second opinions. And because right now you can see patients across state lines, they're using telemedicine as the opportunity to create, um, to open up kind of the floodgates for second opinions, um, cash pays second opinions for a couple of them. And then I've got several physicians who are doing live events on social media. So they're turning the, the event, the Q and A, um, World Voice Day is coming up this week, I think. And we have a, a voice care event that's happening with five or six different providers and they're reaching out to the community that uses their voice on a regular basis, making it where you, it's, you know, basically it's a webinar, but they're doing it. It, it gives them something to market. It gives them something to really like position their expertise. Then they get the video, they record it. It becomes a downloadable asset. They turn it into a nice piece of long form content. We're seeing Q and A's with doctors, things of that nature, but all around these live events and then using their assets to market the live events. And so it's an opportunity for the physician and the provider to still be engaged, but it's also, it provides you something, um, a story to tell. And when you, like how John was saying, you know, we're looking for positive stories. So if we can create those positive stories for the physician community, their patients are sitting at home looking for something to digest. And so if they can provide the right type of thing, patients love their doctors. And so for the first time in a long time, our physicians across certain specialties have time to engage. And so let's create the opportunity for them to engage with patients. And from a practical perspective, one tip, if you're doing a podcast or a video with a provider or a physician extender, developing your script in advance, it, it allows the physician to be more comfortable but more importantly, it really cuts down on the amount of editing you have to do after the fact. Hey, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. I've got a question for the panelists, um, and e anyone can chime in. Um, I've been implementing systems for about 25 years now, um, some healthcare, but most not. Um, there's this concept that came about a long time ago called digital immigrants versus digital natives. Uh, most of us who have kids understand that most of them don't know life without the iPhone. Um, but most of us who've used a rotary phone or understand what 14.4 and, and 28.8 is, we understand what life was like before the internet. Um, what's been the adoption rate of a lot of your doctors who might have graduated college before 84 and after 84 when it comes to some of these digital things that you guys are talking about? I, Alonzo, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, I don't know the percentages, but I know that some of the docs required a lot more handholding than others. And I think it goes back to, especially as we're related like to telemedicine, um, it's choosing the right platform that works for your audience, whether it's a physician or a patient. I have a practice in South Florida who went live on a telemedicine platform that was app-based. 
and they chose it because it would integrate with their EHR and also there was a pay, um, a payment uh, payment option and a way for patients to sign forms. And we found out very quickly because it was an older population that the number one issue we were having is people being asked to reset their password on their iPhone or Android device. And people have no idea how to reset that password. So they were missing appointments all along the way. And so that company, rather than lose that client, actually had to go in and create a browser-based application of their of their um, telemedicine software. And then on the on that side, Alonzo, another area that we dealt with is so if you use a browser-based telemedicine application, we would find that it would only work if you had um, Chrome or like Firefox, but it wouldn't work on Internet Explorer and most medical practices are set up on Internet Explorer. So I think that it's like this wild, wild west. Um, I think most people have adopted like, we have, so we have a doctor that wants to do like this live Q&A and he only wants to do it on Instagram, but his following is on Facebook. So you have to know where your audience is and then lean into that audience. But I think what you bring up is a, is a valid, valid concern because we're adopting this technology so quick and then not really like paying attention to how it impacts the patient experience. And it's not just like on the provider side, but the patient side. If they can't, if even if your connection is good, if their connection is piss poor, that's gonna be their experience with your practice. And so now I think practices are stepping back and looking at what they can do to kind of improve that experience. But I think that's a really good question. I'd be interested how the rest of the panel, um, what you're dealing with related to that. Two thoughts, Jennifer. Um, historically, a lot of the older docs are not early acquirers. Um, we're seeing the 27 year old docs. Um, they're they're within practices now and they're pushing this. But the other side of the coin is it's it's really the patient and the age of the patient. Um, if you've got a 50 plus year old patient, you may have issues. But if they've got uh, children like myself. Uh, it's the, with seniors, they are assisting with this. So it really comes down to the level um, of the end user or the patient. And that's uh, why it's the Wild West. Mm -hmm. I think the key is you, you really do have to make sure that you, you're, you're using people who are known in the industry, uh, especially if it's a first time endeavor. Um, that's really the, the most important part uh, because if you start out wrong that will be the impression going forward so it's always better to do your research ask around call people and say hey who are you using what do you think um talk to your peers who may be involved in this as well but it's it's better to go with uh tried and true than someone who is just coming at you offering different modalities. Can we see it in rural countryside America? Um, telemedicine is supposed to be the uh, solution, but if they have poor service in those areas, the experience will still be poor. I, I would I would say uh, as a suggestion, and and kind of you touched on it, but to know your know your patients too like uh, john you touched on it with your with your the demographic if you have patients that are more you know that 50 plus that may be challenged on a computer uh rather than others that are younger or any of that sort is to know your audience so that you're providing a platform that they can easily be able to to administer or to be able to access um because i know the challenges as as you had mentioned you know my folks are up there and Doc wants to do something and I'm over there trying to get it all set up and fixed up for them. So knowing your your patients, I think, is a key to know what platform is going to work best for your practice. Um, 
I want to open up if there are any other questions. We're kind of winding down. We've got about uh, eight, eight or nine minutes here. Are there any other questions from the gallery? You can either send them in the text uh, chat area, or if you want to want to connect, let me know. If you're on a phone, I'll unmute the phones. I just want to make sure that you've got your backgrounds there. So if anybody does have a question. What I, I also wanted to reference is that in medical practices, in that newsletter, in that social posting on Instagram, educate your patients about what COVID is and isn't. Um, there's a lot of uh, bad information floating around. Uh, some information out there is 5G networks is causing this. There's other information that uh, uh, that this is a grand conspiracy by the elite to take over the universe. Educate your patients. They need to know what is this? How does it affect you? And what are the precautions you can take? Self-isolation, um, stay at home, whatever those are, building up your immune system. Um, your patients need to be educated. Um, and, and make sure that when you're educating them, you're getting the most current information so that you're giving them the most current information. Otherwise, they're going to be off into these tangents, uh, which may impact your business. You want to lead now. You want to know as much as you can know about COVID uh, so that when your patients ask you a question, well, if I come into your office, um, will I get sick? Um, are you going to have a glass petition up so that um, people aren't infecting me? Are you going to make, how are you going to stagger patients coming into the office, you, you have to start getting ready. One, you have to educate, but two, you have to start being able to answer questions about COVID. It, it doesn't mean you're going to be giving them a cure, but you're letting them know, as far as you know, from the information you've gotten from the National Health Institute or uh, whatever the organizations are, you need to let them know what is it how does it affect me what can i do to protect myself why are you why are we being um why is our office closed here's why it's closed when do you expect to open we expect to open as soon as they give the all clear but your patients are clamoring to get information about this this virus and they're terrified right now so, so Quentin, just to go, we did get a question that popped in. I want to make sure we're getting to folks' questions. Um, are any of your client practices using home visits? And if the doctor is not making the visit, but using a paraprofessional, are they offering telehealth con consults? No home visits. None of my doctors are doing home visits. I can correct. Medicine. Yeah, I, I don't have anyone doing home visits. I've got um, I've got some physical therapy practices that are using telehealth, and so that's come online in the last week or so that they were able to get. They've got about thirty offices, and then um, one thing that we have dealt with are maybe MAs seeing a um, seeing the patient first and kind of getting them like teed up and ready for the physician and then having to deal with the fact that you've got maybe an MA in one location, but the physician in another location. And how do you transfer the patient um, just like you would if they were in the office sitting in a waiting room? And so that's something that we're having to um, to manage as well. And so, you know, that's that goes back to choosing the right telehealth provider because we have some practices where, you know, the MA is getting them set up in the office through telehealth, and but then the provider was in the hospital, so now he's on a quarantine, and they're having to transfer it to the provider's home. And so we're dealing with some of that, but nobody in, in the home at this point. 
Andrew, one of my clients is a, a chiropractic service that's got about 200 um, chiropractors, and they're mm -hmm. still actually able to perform um, visits because it's kind of hard to do telehealth when you need an adjustment. So they're taking <laughs> all the necessary protocols as far as masks and gloves and, and you know, cleaning the benches off and thoroughly wiping everything down between um, clients. But um, they're still actively in, actively in practice. Nice. Are there any other questions coming in? We've got about another minute or two. If there's anybody else that has a comment or a quote, and if not, um, I'd like you. Is there any potty, uh, last parting uh, comments that you'd like to make, John, Jennifer, and and uh, Quentin? This country needs great stories. Um, the hydrochloroquine in the ZPAC seems to be a uh, a good story. We're seeing it uh, in South Korea. We're uh, we're getting um, great stories out of our backyard at Parish Medical C um, Center, uh, and I could go on and on about it. Uh, but uh, send us good stories. Just uh, go to OrlandoMedicalNews.com. Don't want to do a shameless plug, but we'll get good stories out there. And thank, thank you for doing this, uh, Andrew and Dorothy. You're welcome. Jennifer? Just everybody stay safe, stay home. Remember that we're going to get through this. And at the end of the day, we're, we truly are all in it together. And so I think it's good information. Um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity right now for everybody to double down on working on their business and not so much in their business. And so, you know, each and every one of us on this call are concerned about how to market our practice or how to build our individual businesses. And so start looking, you know, take a step back, use this opportunity to take a step back and, and identify ways that we can all grow. And hopefully at the end of the day, we'll, we'll come out of this better for better than we'll, what we walked into. So thank you, Andrew and Dorothy and everybody in the panelists and my neighbor Alonzo, everybody for joining us. It, it's, it's always good to see everyone's face. And I'm going to go back real quick, Quentin. I'm going to get you. Where can they connect with you, Jennifer? Uh, if anybody has questions or needs to follow up with you, they are. You all of these folks are members of the chamber, so they're in our directory. But Jen, how can they contact you if uh, anybody has questions specifically with that? Quentin will finish up here, but Jennifer, if you want to list that real quick, I'm going to put it into the chat right now. Uh, my email and also I'm going to say. Check me out at Dr. Marketing Tips on Apple iTunes and any podcast you listen to. We've got about 240 or so episodes we've put out in the last couple of years. And hopefully we'll be able to take some of this and, and turn it into an episode in the next coming days. But I'm going to throw everything into the chat window. And if anybody needs anything at all, feel free to reach out to me. I'm just sitting at home working. <laughs> John, you're OrlandoMedicalNews.com, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. And then to wrap up, Quentin, what's your last parting words here and where can we connect with you? I think the key is um, be a student of your practice and your business right now. Um, look at the age of your website. If you've not integrated social media into your practice or your business, now's the time. Um, evaluate your operations, look at your team. Are you prepared to go into the future? Do you have the necessary protocols to get you from point A to point B? Have you started preparing your practice to begin to get back to business? Um, and what safety protocols are you initiating to ensure that you're safe and that your patients are safe? Um, the service Andrew is providing here is fantastic, and we really appreciate being a part of it. Um, I am always on LinkedIn, um, but if you can't reach me via LinkedIn, you can also email me at socialmedia for doctors at Gmail, and that's social media for doctors at Gmail. But nine times out of ten, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll get a response from me for sure. Great. Well. Once again, we appreciate everybody on the panel. John, Jennifer, Quentin, thank you very much for being here. All of this information and this will be repeated and saved on our website at eocc.org. 
we thank you for being there. And all of the other uh, pieces of information are on our same website. Go to our resources tab, and you can see here for the recorded webinars that we've had. So if there's any information that you've missed or like to repeat, feel free to do so. We do appreciate all that our panelists have had and our members that are here. We want you all to safe, stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, we appreciate you coming on to uh, the East Orlando Chamber to participate. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll be putting more out. So keep a bridge to what we're doing. We look forward to having you at, a, at on another uh, another call. And uh, like I said, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to having you again. Thank Take you care, very everybody. much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. You're very welcome.